and welcome to the Connected Conversations for Creatives podcast, a place where creatives like you can learn, grow, and connect. I'm your host, Jennifer Carr. In the early days of the internet, user-generated content was a novel concept, a digital frontier where anyone with a connection could become a content creator. From humble beginnings of simple text-based forums and rudimentary personal websites, this movement of individual expression has undergone a profound metamorphosis. It has blossomed into a multimedia symphony where videos, images, music, and more are crafted and shared by individuals across the globe. But this transformation was not merely technological, it was societal. The democratization of content creation driven by platforms like YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok reshaped our media landscape and redefined celebrity. It broke down the traditional gatekeepers, allowing voices previously marginalized to rise to prominence. Yet as this digital ecosystem grew, so did its challenges. Creators faced issues of content ownership, monetization, and dependency on centralized platforms. This brings us to the present day and the revolutionary concept of Web3. Web3, with its decentralized infrastructure, blockchain technology, and crypto-enabled ecosystems, promises to revolutionize the very foundations of user-generated content. It seeks to liberate creators from the confines of platforms, providing them with unprecedented control over their work and revenue streams. Creators can now directly engage with their audiences, tokenize their creations, and benefit from a fairer distribution of value. But why is the shift to Web3 so crucial for creators? Well, today's guest hopefully has the answers we seek. He is a passionate writer who's delved deep into the world of finance and technology and has honed his storytelling skills over the years in order to make complex topics engaging and accessible. So today, I would love to welcome to the show, Alan Taylor. Welcome. Wow, that was an awesome introduction. Thank you, <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> you are so welcome. And I am so thankful that you're here. I'm just going to give some full transparency. We have had this conversation once before and due to some technological issues, which was ironic in so many ways based on our conversation, that we've had to come back and do this for a second time. And this time I'm flying solo, whereas before I had a technological guru next to me who was going to help us along. But I've done some research of my own and I have studied up a little bit. And based on our conversation before, I'm hoping that we can make this happen. But before we dive into the deep end uh, of the technology and tech finance, tell us about yourself just into the foray of these worlds. Well, uh, I've been a writer for a long time, uh, going over 30 years. Uh, I've been in journalism. I've written fiction and poetry. I've been published in multiple, media, multiple mediums uh, as a writer. The last 17 years, I've spent freelancing, uh, writing business content for, uh, for various companies in various industries, and narrowed down my niche over the years uh, to financial technology in 2013 and then to blockchain and cryptocurrency technology in 2018. And that allowed me to dive deep into the topics we'll talk about today. And I'm really excited to be able to share that with your audience. Yeah, I'm excited too. It is a world that, you know, I, I grew up with always having a computer in our home. We always had technology going, you know, we had from, from dial up to, you know, the, the first T1 line, that kind of thing. We had, we've always had access to the internet. And I remember um, the days of everything was text-based. I, I, I'm not even going to lie when I, I was probably three and I would sit in my dad's lap and we would play Wheel of Fortune um, on our little tiny computer with the green screen. It's like, uh, doo -doo. and so, you know, there's always <laughs> been technology in our home. And just when the access to the internet became something that everybody had in their house, uh, that was exciting. But it also became a lot bigger, a lot faster than I think everybody really expected it to, which meant somebody had to be in control of it. Um, and that's where kind of Web3 has entered the picture. So let's ease into that tech talk and just kind of start by giving us um, an overview of what Web3 is and how it differs from that traditional web that we're used to. Certainly. Well, experts break down the web into three distinct phases. And the early phase of the web in the 90s it was read only. All you could do is interact with the pages. Uh, you could click on a link, go to another page. That one, uh, was pretty much all you could do is read uh, what was on the page. There wasn't any video, not much audio. It was all text-based. And then in the late 90s, we started seeing our first user-generated content platforms and first social media platforms. Uh, then we had the dot-com bust in, in 2000. And when we came out of that, a, a new web emerged. Web 2 is what we call it. It was read-write, and we're currently in that phase. And uh, so uh, basically, users all of a sudden could interact with each other on the web page and sometimes in, in uh, real time. And so then you started getting audio and video uh, started coming on board. So 
uh, this was the period when you had, you know, MySpace and Facebook and YouTube, all of these social media legacy platforms that we're familiar with were birthed in the early phase of Web 2, and they have just grown since then. Well, Web 3 now is in the early days, uh, probably late 90s time period with regard to uh, the development uh, timeline uh, that corresponds with Web 2. So we're kind of like in the GeoCities six degrees uh, time frame for Web 3. And we call it read, write, own. And, on, and so what we've done with uh, the developers who are building Web 3 is they've added to what the creator economy has has developed in Web 2. And so there's a new layer on top of the internet that we know that allows uh, creators to better uh, protect their identities, own uh, fans can own a piece of the content that creators create creators can monetize their content better data is more secure intellectual property can be better managed uh, using the tools that are offered in web3 so we're seeing this new development that is going to empower more people across the globe to have more freedom and more power more control over their creations I remember you said GeoCities. I'm like, I remember I had the dinkiest little GeoCities website. It was the coolest thing because, you know, you could put pictures on there and and, and you could, it, but it was, it was text and photos and there was not much interaction. You would send your link to somebody and be like, hey, check out my website. And, you know, they'd be like, hey, that's cool. And, and they would tell you this through like your AOL instant messenger or whatever. So yes. <laughs> those were the good old days when, when you first started and, and you felt like a master of, of the internet when you could do that kind of thing. And that was pretty fantastic. Yeah, I didn't know. GeoCities was really cool because if you didn't know HTML, if you didn't know how to build a website, then you could have a website. You just had to go to GeoCities and you could have your own website. And it was the first website that that monetized user generated content. So that was a that was a really uh, cool thing back then. It's very interesting. And of course, you know, I was in high school, I think it was middle school, high school era. And, and so I didn't know, I didn't have a need to monetize things. But looking back now, um, if there's a way other than just selling stuff on my platform, instead of having a book for sale, if there was a way to monetize all the content that I have um, just through building a website, that's pretty fantastic. And in your book, you do highlight um, the potential benefits of Web3 for just various types of creators from social media influencers to artists and, and authors. So um, what are some of the like, specific examples of leveraging Web3 tools that listeners might find easily accessible? Yeah, great question. So you know, if you're an author uh, and you publish books, the really cool tools that are emerging now is you can uh, publish books as NFTs, non-fungible tokens that allow book buyers the right to own the book instead of renting it from Amazon. So as an owner, the buyer can resell the book and then potentially make a profit on that book or sell it at a loss. But the bottom line is they can sell the book. You can't sell an Amazon book. You can't uh, transfer it to somebody else. So, But you can do that with Web3 books. And um, the creator of that book can earn a residual off of the resale. So you get some passive income. So that's a powerful, really powerful tool that current book publishing models don't offer. Some artists are already making a pretty decent living selling their artwork as NFTs. Fans become owners of the artwork and uh, the technology tracks that ownership over time. So you can prove uh, you know, that it's an original and you can prove that it is a uh, a bona fide work of such and such artist, and uh, it could increase value over time. Influencers are also using NFTs uh, in really interesting ways to create proof of attendance for events, which acts as a badge of honor for fans who can say that they attended a certain exclusive event and, and have the proof of that. Uh, these popes, as they're called, may rise in value over time, and they could later be resold. Another way influencers are using tokens is by creating exclusive spaces for their fans. So they can be done through Discord on the influencer's website or through other channels on the web. Uh, they're really getting creative with the way that these tokens are being used. And it doesn't really matter what kind of creator you are, you musician, photographer, painter, whatever your talent is. There is a way that you can use these tokens to enhance uh, your ability to sell and profit from your works.
And, and one of the key themes uh, in your book is ownership and control. And that's a very familiar topic for me just because that's why I published on my own and, and opted not to go the traditional route. I did attempt to go that route and I decided there's a lot more control and ownership that I wanted to maintain and, and creative decisions and that kind of thing. But I maintain all of the rights to my works. And so I totally respect that and, and appreciate that concept. I was talking to a lawyer, an entertainment lawyer a couple of weeks ago, and she was saying, you know, one of the one one of the things that authors particularly forget to do is to copyright their work. Uh, and, and, you know, your work is technically copyrighted from the time you put it on the page, but That's to right. register to, to register that work as a copyrighted work. And, um, be, and what that does is it gives you some legal backing to say, hey, somebody has used my work and now I can sue or, you know, get yeah. received damages, whatever. Um, I love the idea of being able to basically tag my work and say, That's mine. But not only have I tagged it, but it's a value add that I can say, if this person has it, they sell it, I'm still making money, they make money, and more people have my work in their hands. And so it's a win-win-win across the board. Right. Yeah. There's some really cool tools um, online So uh, with Web3. So blockchain technology being immutable means the data can't change once, uh, once you have, once you publish it. When you create on the blockchain, it gets a timestamp. And so no one can come along later and say, I created this. And and so if it happens on the blockchain, because the blockchain is public, you know, it's a public record, anyone can go and verify a claim. So uh, it's less risk somebody stealing your work. Uh, and it's possible that, you know, years down the road, our current copywriting trademarking system could be replaced with this immutable technology that tracks and protects those um, IP assets for all types of creators. That's exciting. That's super exciting. And it, it takes the, I don't want to sound um, conspiratorial, but it takes the government's hands out of my personal work. It, you know, it takes those hands that I don't want involved in my business and says, you know what, this is mine. I don't need your stamp of approval. I'm going to take care of my own. And so that's that's a whole other conversation we could probably have at another time. But <laughs> right. you know, so with going going down the line, um, monetization, talking about, you know, author of a work and the reseller and the reseller and the reseller, you know, um, all have some sort of monetization perk to do with uh, this technology. So it's always been a challenge for creators. And something that um, I've learned just in the recent past is that creators who are able to monetize quickly and exponentially are the ones who have like large and established audiences and or viewers. You know, you have yeah. to have so many um, subscribers on YouTube to even start monetizing your channel. And the same is true on TikTok. Um, I think they might make very few exceptions. You can appeal decisions and stuff, but you still have, like, you have to grow at a certain rate. You have to um, produce so much uh, content in a day and it's exhausting. So mm -hmm. how does Web3 really change that game when it comes to revenue generation? And what are some of the innovative ways creators can earn income without already having hundreds of thousands of followers? Yeah, that's a great question. So the bottom line for creators is you have more power to influence your own outcomes. So instead of relying on these legacy social media platforms to build your audience that you then have to drive back to your own web properties before you can monetize them. The monetization methods are actually baked into the technology, and that's done in three different ways. Uh, so the first way is through rewards. Uh, platforms like Hive and Minds and several others uh, have, uh, they pay creators rewards just for showing up, creating content, interacting with others. And those rewards can provide a secondary income for the creator. Non-fungible tokens allows creators to create a digital asset that is then sold in the marketplace. And that creates a revenue stream for the creator. When a fan resells that asset, the creator can earn a residual and that digital asset then becomes a passive income stream for the creator. Another uh, method is through protocols. Now, by definition, a protocol isn't owned or controlled by anyone. So blockchain protocols allow you to uh, build on top of the technology, create something that wasn't there before. And that can be an app, a platform, another protocol. But by becoming a builder, creators can essentially influence their own distribution and monetization channels. So you have different options as a creator using the tools of Web3. I like that. Um, we were looking into Hive and um, 
like uh, we after our first conversation, Rob, my husband had started looking into Hive and was like, you know, this is a really great idea. It's a very cool concept. And just for me as an author, because I'm already creating content that that involves words and writing and that kind of thing, it's really easy, um, you know, if, if I have extra time to say, hey, here's some content that I've generated from whether it's you know, a podcast or something like that, blog post, that kind of thing. And you along with already having content that's easily you know, push outable also the whole you have this whole network of other um creators or just readers and audience already just already established looking you're know, already interested mm-hmm. in um and seeking out the content that's being provided and so and it's not super complicated. You kind of have, there, there's an entry point level at, at which you might need a little bit of help getting started. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, it's really a cool concept that says, hey, we're all here with the same purpose in mind and we're all yep. here to support one another. So not only are you generating revenue, but you're creating a community and a network of supporters. Exactly right. And on Hive, uh, they're very supportive of each other. And so they build up these communities where people uh, with like interests can go share their content, vote for each other's content. And the cool thing about it is you don't just earn uh, by creating, you can also earn by curating. And so you can curate other people's content and still earn. And if you just want to read and upvote other people's content, you you can be a fan and earn on Hive uh, without ever even... uh, creating a blog post. And, and that's really, really cool. That is cool. It's like everybody benefits. You know, there's a value add for everybody that's involved. So um, you, you you monetize yourself, I guess, just by participating. So that's pretty cool. I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the hot topics in today's digital landscape is privacy and ownership. And, you know, I know that when you take, take the, the big umbrella companies like you know, Facebook or Meta or um, whatever, the whole new threads, uh, I mean, uh, Elon on X, and you take all those big hands and big names out of the picture, um, you know, who's left in charge? And so we want to make sure that um, our stuff is protected uh, because they do have some things in place, but at the same time, they have a lot of control over what you can and can't post. So in this um, digital landscape or whatever, how does Web3 address the concerns of privacy and ownership and and protecting content and audience data? Yeah, great question. So with Web3 tools, it's no longer necessary to collect email addresses and personal identification. Um, You can deliver your creations from wallet to wallet. So for instance, if you want to collect an NFT from your favorite author or artist or whatever, all you got to do is go to OpenSea or Readle or one of the other platforms where they're offered for sale. And then you buy the NFT, it's delivered to your wallet, uh, which doesn't carry or is not associated with your name or email address or any other personally identifying information. So you no longer need to worry about your personal information being collected and sold on the dark web for pennies on the dollar. In cases where identifiers are necessary, you don't have to provide your real name. Uh, because the platforms that I discuss in my book are not financial institutions, they don't have to um, do KYC, which is know your customer. Um, It's a legal requirement for financial institutions, uh, but it isn't for the social media platforms. Some of them still do it, but I I stay away from those because I don't see the the necessity in in that um, aspect of those platforms. So I stick to the ones that don't, and the ones I recommend are decentralized, which makes KYC unnecessary, undesirable, and a lot more fun to um, interact on the platforms. Just for uh, listeners' sake, and, and this is something that I, I learned when uh, we, we took a, a little dive into some cryptocurrency a few years ago, and um, we, we dabble and, and have it just sitting there doing its thing as, as you will, but we learned about you know, this. You said wallet to wallet. Um, what some people might need to understand is that we are talking about um, invisible currency, right? There, there are no dollars switching hands. There's no debit cards involved. It's, it's literally digital currency. And you do have a little digital wallet and um, it comes with this 4 million character code to, to enter and to use <laughs> and that kind of thing. And, and if you lose it, you're out of luck. So, um, yep. but at the same time, like there, there's some, um, there's a slight learning curve when it comes to that, learning these words and this uh, technology. And so, how accessible, you know, like we're all very familiar with our TikTok and our Facebook apps on our phones. Um, so for those of us who might not be tech savvy and are still learning some of those details, like how accessible are Web3 tools for creators? Yeah, uh, great question. So they're pretty accessible, but there are some challenges. And so like you mentioned, there is a little bit of a learning curve. So you have to learn a little bit about 
you know, you're learning a new language, essentially. In the early days, nobody knew what FTP was, you know, file transfer protocol, but it's a necessary protocol for building and publishing websites. Nowadays, virtually everybody understands that you need a website, that you have to publish it to the web. Even if they don't understand what FTP is or how to use it, they do know somebody that knows and can help them out. So since we're in the early days of Web3, there's going to be a learning curve. Uh, you're going to have to learn a new language. you got to understand what a wallet is, how to use it, learn what uh, blockchains are and which ones um, are the best ones for creating NFTs versus you know, other benefits. Uh, you'll have to learn how to do crypto transfers from one wallet uh, to another uh, and how to do it securely and inexpensively. So those are all things that can be learned, but they're fairly accessible. Some of them may not be intuitive and may have a larger learning curve than others. But I think uh, if, you know, if you apply yourself and if you can learn to navigate the internet and play around on Facebook, I think you can also learn how to use these tools. Oh, listen, those of us who grew up on MySpace and, and learning, I mean, we had to code our own pages, you know, you were learning, if you can learn <laughs> to code your own MySpace page, you know, because in the beginning, yeah. it wasn't a point and click. Uh, and now, you know, you say FTP, but what everybody doesn't understand is the, the browse click upload. That's what FTP is, you know, it's like you're transferring exactly. your files your, from your computer to your online presence, whatever that is. And so it just looks different. It is a little more intuitive because they realized, oh, not everybody needs to understand file transfer protocol. You know, they need to understand browse. Right. Right. click upload <laughs> and yeah and on facebook simpler. the ftp is built into the platform so but you yes. know facebook is using that protocol every time you upload a, a picture of your dog <laughs> to yes. your yes. facebook <laughs> page and you know a lot of people don't know that but that's what they're doing and so web3 is building the tools in a different kind of way they're still using ftp um they're still using the all traditional protocols of the internet uh, there are several of them and I go into some detail about what they are, um, breaking it down very simply in Web3 Social, just to, to show the history of the internet and where it came from and why decentralization matters. And so I go into that uh, in the book to help you know people who are not familiar with it understand that these tools are easy to learn, even if you don't really want to get into the nitty gritty of the technological details, just having a basic understanding of how it works is really beneficial. It is. And and three, like you said, it's still in the early stages of just widespread adoption because not everybody is going to, they're going to see it. And they're going to be like, oh, I can't do that. That's too technologically advanced for me. Um, whereas, you know, you make it very simple to understand in, in your book, Web3 Social, and, and we're going to make sure that everybody knows about that book before we end our conversation. But there are resources out there to make it simpler. Aside from maybe some learning curve issues, are there potential risks of any sort that creators should be aware of when diving into this new ecosystem? Yeah, there, you know, there are some challenges. There are some risks. First, you know, crypto is volatile. This is the first thing that everybody says. Well, you know, Bitcoin can go up or down and extreme values and wild swings in a very short time. And that's true. A lot of the smaller coins uh, are even more so. I would say do your research, know what you're getting into, and don't freak out, you know, whenever your cryptocurrency that you're earning on such and such platform goes up and down in value. What I remind myself of is, you know, I didn't buy this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm earning it on a platform. It's basically free. I spent some time. Uh, so if it goes up or down in a short period of time, that's okay. I'm not, don't worry about that. I'm not day trading. Day traders care about that. If you're looking at the long term, it's not that big a deal. You're not worried about that. Secondly, security is very important. Uh, in Web3 Social, I talk about the various types of wallets and which ones are the most secure and, you know, they all have their benefits in, in the way that you can use them, but you want to keep your earnings where they'll be most secure. So um, you have to think short term, long term. Am I going to be using this on a daily basis? And if so, then maybe you keep some of it in your browser based wallet. But browser based wallets are not totally secure because browsers can be hacked. So you want to keep your crypto in if you're going to hold it long term, you want to keep it in a, a wallet. Uh, that is not 
connected to the internet all the time. So, you know, it's a cold wallet. So I talk about that in the book. Security is very important. We're not used to being vigilant about our own security. So, you know, if we lose our password to our bank account, we can call the bank. They've got a secret password. Uh, you just tell them your mom's maiden name or whatever <laughs> question you identified that you want to answer, and they'll let you back into your bank account. There is nothing like that in Web3. So you have to you have to be vigilant about securing your passwords and your keys and your secret phrases uh, and keeping them safe. Uh, and, and we're just not used to doing that. So you have to step up that mindset a little bit. Um, another thing is in social media, you get um, these links, these come ons, you know, get this free crypto, this airdrop and all this. I don't click on any links from people I don't know. Uh, on my social accounts and you'll get spam emails. So um, you have to really keep an eye on that kind of thing and uh, don't let curiosity get the best of you. Yeah, there's no such thing as, you know, an easy dollar. Like <laughs> this, it, there is, but there isn't because if somebody's offering you something that sounds too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> like just, exactly. just throwing that out there. And you got to <laughs> yeah. check your sources. You know, I get these, yeah. uh, you know, on Twitter, especially it's really easy. Somebody can tag you and they can talk about, you know, get this, you know, mumbo jumbo, brand new, wing ding cryptocurrency i've never heard of and if i've never heard of it then you know it's questionable it, it may yeah. be a good thing but it's questionable so i don't let those things distract me from where uh, i'm going and where i want to go yeah no it's amazing to me how um willy-nilly we are with our security online you know we hear all of these stories about people's information being taken or computers being taken over and, and held ransom and you know it just it boggles <laughs> my mind that we we do we we put our bank account where all of our money is we call them up and be like hey what's my password again i'm like we have put that in somebody else's hands and so i think just in general even if you're not looking at crypto and that kind of thing like Get a little more careful about your security online. Exactly. We live in one. It, we live in one of those ages where it is too easy for someone to get their hands on something of yours that they don't need to have their hands on. <laughs> exactly right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and and that's just my TED talk for today. Like that's that has nothing to do with a whole lot of anything. <laughs> just oh my goodness, but, you know, it wasn't a big deal back in the day because people weren't up to snuff. When I mean, it was those black hats that you had to look out for. They weren't coming after my bank account, but now it's like. They make it so easy and, and yeah. they can come after you click on that. And, oh, I thought it was from PayPal. That was not an email from PayPal, Grandma. You should not have clicked that. Just saying. <laughs> right. Anyway, for opinion, what is the most exciting and transformative aspect of Web3 for creatives? And like, where do you see it heading in the future for those who choose to embrace it? Yeah, uh, wonderful question. Uh, for me, uh, Web3 is about uh, having the ability to control your own creations in a way that's never been available before. You know, monetization is one aspect of that. We tend to focus on the money, but there are other, other benefits as well. So you can, you know, creators can assign intellectual property rights in new and innovative ways. You know, think about, you know, the creative commons. You know, Web2 gave us this uh, really cool way to share our creations outside of the restrictive uh, legal copyright framework that was created for a time period before the internet. And so the internet gave rise to this whole new uh, way of doing that. Blockchain technology, taking that one step further and allowing you to collaborate with other um, creators in ways that's never been done before. You know, on Amazon, if you publish a book, for instance, you can't, you can't there's no way to split royalties between uh, co-authors or authors and illustrators. But in Web3, you can do that. So I think in 10 to 15 years, the web is going to look very differently than it does now. And I don't think Web 2 is going away completely, but most of us will move beyond Web 2 into a new way of thinking about online content, how to create it, how to monetize it, and how to protect it. Hey, like it never really occurred to me because, you know, I have um, an editor who edits my books and I pay her up front and I say, you know, this is a flat fee that um, I pay her and she comes up with it based on the number of words that I'm giving her and how, mm -hmm. um, how my timeline and that kind of thing. And, and so after we had talked before, I was like, you know, this is a very interesting concept because her name is on the book, but once she's made that flat fee, she's not getting paid again. So if you are someone who, you know, I don't want to say a sideline character, but you're not the main author, but you still had a hand in that book you're not getting royalties unless that is something you have worked into your contract. But what a great way for those who, you know, 
you just because you edited it one time, like other people are reading it. I wrote the book one time. Other people are reading it. I'm getting paid for it. Why isn't my editor? That is definitely something they could take into account and say, I'm still part of this project and I should still be getting paid for it. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you bring up a great point. You know, I do book editing for clients and, you know, they pay me, like you say, a flat fee. But if it was someone that I knew could sell a lot of books, I could work out a different arrangement. You know, I might not yeah. take a fee at all. I just say, look, uh, share 3% of your royalties with me and I can make more money. I mean, if, <laughs> if I got 3% yeah. of the royalties of James Patterson, <laughs> that's a pretty big <laughs> cut, you know? <laughs> yeah, you would be so, set. You wouldn't need to edit another book. Just his. So that's a great arrangement. And, and, you're, and you're right, because with children's books, you have illustrators mm -hmm. typically, you know, and not just the cover art, but inside the pages. And so those creators get paid as well. And a lot of times a royalty arrangement is a better arrangement uh, for an illustrator than a, a flat fee. So uh, I think those opportunities are going to come in even greater numbers in the future. That's exciting just to, to see, because, you know, for those of us who self-publish, you know, we want the cost for everything. We don't have a publishing house behind us. We don't have somebody right. saying here. So if we can lower our upfront cost by saying, let's talk about, you know, we're going to um, pay this upfront and then royalties. Yeah, no, that would be. That's a game changer. And oh, that could I incentivize that could mm -hmm. incentivize your partners to actually get on board with the marketing and help you sell the book. You pay an illustrator a flat fee or an editor a flat fee, they don't really care if the book sells or not. They got paid. And, you know, of course they want you to be successful uh if they want repeat business. But how much more powerful would it be to have your you know, book cover artist, your editor, your illustrator, all your partners helping you market the book so that they could increase the royalties. Yeah, because, you know, that flat fee is a one-time deal, but you're talking, this could be a lifetime of, you know, exactly. income yeah. that trickles in down the road. No, that's fantastic. Uh, and I could see how it would absolutely um, spark collaboration just in different arenas, not even writing. I talk about that one because that's what I'm in, but just different arenas in general when you're talking about um, the marketing part of it, because my goodness, I can see where um, NFTs would be really handy when it comes to, because it's really hard to find people to get on board to to market your your stuff. But that's what influencers do. That's what TikTok influencers are all about. They go market somebody right. else's to get paid. Well, if there was a way to incentivize other people more easily, I think uh, that, that mm, you've got my wheels turning this morning and I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> well, awesome. It's great to see. Uh, I can see you're as excited about this as I am. And that's awesome because that means if you're if you're that excited about the technology, uh, you're more likely to go and try it out. And yeah, uh, you know, it's, like anything else, it's not perfect. There are ways to improve it. I think it will improve over time. Uh, but we're in a great uh, period in history, I think, for creators. The creator economy has, has blossomed in the last decade to billions of dollars worldwide. It is a thriving economy all on its own. It's only going to get bigger and better. And Web3, I think, uh, has a lot to offer creators. And creators can take that creator economy to even greater heights using the tools that we're talking about. Absolutely. Because even in, even when things got super hard, if you look at, you know, just three years ago, what was the one thing that pulled people through? It was the arts. It was creativity. It was books. It was music, all of these things, you know, it, it, Art is always something that brings people together, uh, you know, and so if, if we can find a way to just mm, utilize some of these tools, and yes, again, you have to go into it understanding that it's not probably going to be something that you can point and click and immediately get it. It's not as, it's not like picking up your cell phone and hitting an app button and then it opening up for you. You have to be willing to take the time to understand it and to learn how to utilize it. Yeah. But once you do, like that potential there is pretty endless. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's a lot of fun. I've had fun learning the tools. Uh, I've played around on a lot of these different platforms, learned which ones I like, which ones I don't. Um, there are some that I won't ever go back to. Uh, there are some that I would love to go back to if they had something else that they're currently missing or, you know, uh, so they're not bad platforms. There's just maybe a couple of things that I would change. And then there are those that I just can't stay off of. And so uh, you know, <laughs> like Hive. Hive is what is become my favorite because it's a great mix of decentralization, uh, monetization, and censorship resistance, all three of which are important to me as a creator.
Oh, yeah. You said the C word, that censorship. That is one of those things that I don't think um, people really take seriously. But if you look back just in the last two years, you know, there have been plenty of times where people have been canceled because they shared an opinion or they wrote something or they created yeah. a character, whatever the case may be. And they were they were basically censored. And that exactly. is a problem because that's what art is about. That's not what creativity is about. It's about being able to express yourself. But once you've been censored, you're no longer allowed to express yourself creatively. And so I love love the idea that there's this new world opening up to artists specific that, that I think artists I mean it's open for everybody but I think artists will benefit from it most um that there's that freedom there's that ownership and there's monetization what else do you need what else are we after yeah I mean like I say it's a lot more you have a lot more ability to control yourself Twitter can cancel you Twitter can mm -hmm. de-platform you uh YouTube can demonetize you and it's happened to creators and it's a world, you know, if you, you spend so many hours building up your followers on these platforms and then you lose that, your whole livelihood could go up and smoke um, just at the snap of a finger. Uh, but with Hive, there's nobody that can cancel you. You know, you have your private keys. Nobody has access to those unless you give access to them. And so there's no one there that can cancel you. No one can demonetize you. And so that's a very important thing, uh, I think, in this world. <laughs> so many people so angry. And, you know, everybody's vying for control and power. Um, and we've given a lot of power to these Web2 platforms. And what they give, they can take away. And I also drive this point home in my book as well. Uh, if the product is free, then you are the product. <laughs> so, um something to keep in mind. I like that. I like that. Um, what have I missed that, that we need to talk about? What have I missed? I feel like there might be something, but I don't know. Or what pops into your head? Oh, wow. Well, we just ticked the button off on uh, the deplatforming thing. So censorship resistance, I, very important for most creators, especially mm -hmm. here in the U.S., where we're not used to somebody, uh, you know, con controlling our our voice you know mm -hmm. it's very important to uh, at least people in the u.s and other western civilizations to be able to express their opinions or express themselves through some art medium and web3 technology takes care of that very important uh, i can't think of anything else we've, we've covered a lot of bases we did. And there's so much more like we could we could sit here for a very long time. Would I understand it all? Probably not. But it's something that I'm interested in learning about. And I know that there are other people who are like me who, you know, like I said, I'm one of those I've embraced technology from the get go. And, and I don't see that changing, especially, you know, kids are basically born knowing how to work cell phones. It was amazing to me. Our kid should be 14 this year and intuitive nature of picking up technology, and just being able to go, oh, I know exactly how this works from, you know, three yeah. years old. And it's wild, but that's the world we live in. And so that's not going away. So you either have to embrace this new technology and use it to your benefit, or you're going to kind of get lost and left behind. And, and the younger people. <laughs> The younger people, like you say, are all cell phones. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, me, I do a lot. I spend a lot of time on my laptop. Uh, mm -hmm. Racing cell phone technology, I'm not there yet. <laughs> Texting and all these, uh, but some of these Web3 platforms, uh, they're just apps. They're smartphone mm -hmm. apps. And so if uh, you're younger and you spend a lot of time on your phone, there are Web3 apps uh, just for you. Uh, you spend more time on your laptop uh, like I do. Um, then you can access Web3 on your computer. And so uh, most of them, however, have both components. So you can you can choose and you can switch back and forth. That's fantastic. That does make it easier because, you know, we are so used to have, like mine is sitting right here, you know, next to me. And so I can see the clock and, and but it's always there. And as soon as we hang up, I'm probably going to pick it up to check the messages that are there. Like they, <laughs> yeah. we're not without it these days, you know, it's with us everywhere. And so that we can take our art and we can take our creativity and we can take all of these things with us anywhere we go and be like, oh, look, I've been inspired. It's time to, you know, create content, whatever the case may be. And then there's the platforms for it. I love that. So, all right. What is one piece of advice or encouragement that you want listeners to walk away with today if they hear nothing else? I would say this. Uh, check out Web3 uh, just to see what it's all about. Because I think once it becomes, and you don't want to be the last person to show up, okay? Uh, I would say be familiar with the tools. Um, it may not be the right time for you to jump in, and that's okay. Uh, but if you're familiar with what's happening, and the direction that the the internet is moving in then when the time is right you'll already be familiar 
with uh, the tools. And, and my book, Web3 Social, is a good introduction to the material, and it'll help you decide when the right time is good for you to get involved. So tell us about your book. Just kind of give us a brief rundown and how listeners can connect with you and your work. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Web3 Social is an introduction to Web3 technology for creators. Uh, I wrote it especially for the creator class to help them understand what Web3 is, what kind of tools are available with Web3. And then I go into some of the history of the internet to talk about why decentralization is important, what the benefits of it are for creators, and then delve into the various platforms uh, that are available for Web3 creators or any creators uh, to use the tools uh, to uh, access the benefits that we've been talking about today. Better monetization, censorship resistance, more control over your intellectual property, data security, and et cetera, et cetera. So now if you want to uh, access me, you, you buy the book at Amazon or any place books are sold. You can go to web34creators.info, download my quick start action guides. Uh, it'll show you, it, it'll give you basic information on how to set up a wallet and that kind of thing just to get started. You can learn more about me at my website, authorallentaylor.com, and join my newsletter at paragraph.xyz at tailored content. And if you want to go check out Hive, where I spend a lot more of my time, uh, it's Alan Taylor. So, um, I'll give you all that information for your show notes, but that's uh, in a nutshell. Thank you. Yeah, that will definitely all be in the show notes and you can, it'll be as easy as going over there and clicking a link and it'll take you to all of those places. Uh, Alan, thank you for being here and being part of this conversation and for just taking us into this foreign world that it's not painful. Like it was a lot less painful to understand than I really was expecting, not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Try to keep it simple. I try to make it easy. So if, uh, if people understand a little bit more about uh, this complex topic now than they did, then I did my job right, I guess. Absolutely. And if nothing else, you've opened the door for them to, to to venture into something that it's going to be hugely beneficial. And like you said, like to be on the cusp of it, like we're here on the on the on the beginning side of it. Yeah, it started. It, it didn't start last year. You know, it's been it's been in the works for a while and kind of creeping up on us. But now that it's becoming more applicable to the everyday people, if you will, like we're starting to see um, the benefits of it. And I think now would be a great time for creators to jump in on that. So thank you so very much for just being here today and for taking us through this. Awesome. Thank you.